So one thing about foot launching is that you do need to launch directly into the wind, especially when it comes to high altitude. High altitude like this and a couple mile an hour wind really matters. So very important that you lay out and run into the wind because you can only physically run so fast and if you got even one and a half mile an hour of wind and you run the wrong way, that's three miles an hour faster that you would have to launch. Trims all the way out, always. Always, always launch with trims out. Why? Because you can eliminate trims with brake. So if you need more lift, you just add brake. But you can't stop a stall <laughs> after it starts. So if you touch even too much brake and you stall your glider, you're screwed and there's nothing you can do about it. So very, very important to always launch trims up. Plus that allows you to accelerate and build extra airspeed that you can just quickly turn into lift by hitting brakes. So all experts launch trims out always. Doesn't matter, trike, foot launching, wind, no wind, doesn't matter, always launch. Trims up. bolted together, all from motorcycles. Used to race bullet bikes. So that kind of gives you the idea that that flat top, being as light as it is and having so much power, and then the Dominator builds the absolute best possible lift at the lowest possible speed. So you have the easiest possible launch. People don't realize that that weight that you carry is absolutely critical. Because if you add an extra six pounds, well, that's X mile an hour that you can't physically run faster. And when you start dropping glider size after glider size, see the goal is to always launch the smallest glider you can easily launch that's in your skill level. Well, the lighter and more powerful your flat top, the smaller the glider you can launch. It used to be I couldn't launch anything smaller than a 24 square meter back in the day because the gliders just didn't build the lift until a high enough speed and with the old Simonini engine, I could only run that fast with that much weight on my back. But now, because of the Ninja is so light, even my 12 year old can fly it, now I can launch an extra, extra small, 19 square meters up at high altitude, easily without really pushing it, no problem. So very, very important. You gotta have all those pieces working in your favor. If you just get some big, huge 28 square meter, well, 95% of the time you can't fly because you don't have the right conditions. As soon as that wind is above 10 mile an hour, you can't fly, and that's a lot of time. So, and it depends on where you live, especially if you live in a windy area or at a beach where there's consistently higher winds, you simply can't fly that extra large glider. So Joe Blow selling you an extra large, it's just not gonna happen. And you can't fly a total death trap piece of crab glider because, you know, the ones that they call reflex that so many have died on, because you simply can't launch at a low enough speed because they're horribly inefficient. 
And of course, getting off the ground at the lowest speed is all about building the most possible lift at the lowest possible speed. That's where the super low aspect ratio of the Dominator really comes into play because you build the absolute highest amount of lift at the absolute lowest possible speed. So you have to have the right gear. You can't, you know, what's on paper, you see, oh, this is a motor, this is a wing, I can fly. Well, no, there's a lot of pieces to it. You gotta have the perfect wing, the absolute best motor, the best physical ability, as well as the highest possible level of skill because a lot of that skill is managing the loading of that glider and controlling the lift. If you don't have super training, these people running with their hands locked out, they're not even touching the brakes. You literally would have to launch at fast trim speed of the glider, which you can't physically run that fast with that much weight on your body. So it's not possible where a super is gonna control that loading. We run up the speed and then add brake and feel that lift and lift ourselves off the ground at the slowest possible speed. But that takes the absolute best feel on the brakes. I mean, any over control, any stall the glider, you don't pull enough, you trip and fall because you're running too fast. So lots of little pieces. Let's go have some fun. along the cliffs. Be super careful if that wing hits a rock or a tree, it could kill you. Woo so don't let that glider hit a rock. Nice. It's just so fun. I have way over 11,000 flights and it just never gets old. It just is the funnest thing ever. It's your own, your own scenery and roller coaster all at the same time. You got the best view in the world and the best ride while doing it. Whoa! go. Woo! How'd you like that one? <laughs> Woo! Up over the trees. Yeah. If you're gonna fly a canyon, it's a good idea to do it going down the canyon, not up the canyon. So I'm gonna flip around and go the other way. Also never head straight at a rock. Always give yourself room to get over it. So even if you miss, you could go to the side. 
Okay, let's flip around and head down the canyon and go have some fun. Ho, ho, ho! Woo! Yeah! Oh, this is so cool. Flying down a canyon. Notice I'm staying a little high just so I got some glide ratio. Just in case. The flat top is the most reliable paramotor on the market, but never trust any engine. Always leave yourself a way out. Of course, I can land on that path as well. Waterfall! Okay, I'm gonna go buzz that. Waterfall time! Woo Woo Scared the heck out of them. Maybe a few people in the audience. That's just seriously awesome! Booyah! Look at these cliffs and sharp rocks, it's so cool! Ninja power! I was gonna hit that tree. Whoa! Whoa, check out this rock! Look at that! Look at that! Woo! Let's go buzz that. Notice I'm staying way to one side, so my out is a 180 to the left. Let's test it. Okay, 180 to the left, and bingo. Yep, no problem. Let's go buzz that little crack in a rock here. Look at this rock. That's so cool! Whoa! Whoa! <laughs> I think I scared the crap out of them. But hey, you're not having fun if you're scared, not scaring people. Doggies. All righty. Look at this. It's just awesome. Yes, be super duper careful in canyons. Make sure you fly down the canyon. And of course, you make sure you got glide ratio to a safe place to land. Again, that's why you fly a Dominator, because of the incredible efficiency. Since I set the world speed record on it, you also know it's automatically the most efficient glider at loading. So if you get a motor out, boom, you just go to glide, and you could glide, shoot, I could glide clear out 
halfway across the city. <laughs> okay. But let's have some fun. in the sport? That's the question right there. That's actually a very valuable question. How do you find an instructor? Well, it's very simple and logical. First of all, you want to find someone who's got the best skills. Well, as with anything, do you want instruction or do you want the best training in the world so you have the absolute best odds of safety. Yeah, it would make sense to get the absolute best training and travel. So many people try and go learn from Joe Blow local and they don't even verify their skill level. They never even check the skill of previous students these people have trained. It is a complete nightmare. So you need to look at the skill level of who you are talking to, then look at the skill level of people they've trained. I make it pretty easy. You just look up WPGA Paramotor World Championships. I'm number one, and you can see my students all the way down through the list. You know, taking, well, nobody in the world can even beat my students. So no other instructor in the world can even compete with my students, the people that I've trained, let alone compete with me. And it's not about bragging, it's about your life. It's very, very critical that you assess the skill of who you're talking to and assess the ability of an instructor. Because just because you're the best pilot in the world doesn't automatically mean you're the best instructor. But if your students have the best skills, and can do things no other instructors or anyone else in the world could do, well then obviously you're the best instructor as well as the best pilot. So it's horrifying how people get linked up with people and they don't check their background. There are totally fake ratings. Uh, there's a couple scam sites. One is called the USPPA, which is a total fraud. It's just a site slapped up there by a guy who does not care about your life. And he slaps it up there and he starts promoting people as certified instructors and actually having them pay him money to promote them as instructors. Well, he's promoting people as instructors who've literally never had a day of training in their life, who don't have even the most basic skills themselves. So very, very important to look. Don't fall for any total bullcrap fake certifications because there is no license. So anyone claiming to be certified is automatically lying. There is no certification. 
So, well, there you go. If somebody says they're certified, don't train with them because instantly you know they're a liar and it would be really stupid to trust your life to a liar. So, don't fall for that. Look at the skill level. Now, if you're looking at a school, find out who your instructor is actually going to be. Because a lot of times, you'll see Joe Blow school, but you have no clue. It's like, oh, I'm training with Aviator PBG. Well, who's your instructor? Well, I don't know. They got this guy and that guy and the other guy. Well, who's your instructor? Oh, I don't know. Well, do you want to train with an I don't know? Do you want your life to be I don't know? Or do you want to train with somebody you know? So, one of the main guys at Aviator PBG, Eric Farewell, never had a day of training in his life. He trained with Blackhawk, and Blackhawk are totally incompetent. They literally don't have even the most basic skills themselves. So why the heck would a guy who trained with Blackhawk suddenly think he's an instructor? Look at the skill level. Is there any video? of him kiting up a vertical wall? Is there any video of him just reverse kiting with no hands? Is there any video of him doing circle foot drags, demonstrating a perfect ability to manage loading and control of the glider? Either people have these skills or they don't. Either their students have these skills or they don't. So the first thing is you find the name of the instructor. And let's, you know, let's use someone like Kurt Pfister. So this guy pretends to be the top US instructor. Literally, this guy pretends he's the top, even though he, he literally doesn't have even the most basic skill. So once you find the name of this instructor, go on YouTube and search for videos of this person demonstrating a mastery level of skill. If they're gonna train you, it's kind of important that they know what the heck they're doing. And if they don't know what the heck they're doing, you don't want to learn from them. So if you search around YouTube, you'll notice not one single video of Kurt Pfister even doing what my brand new students are doing by the end of their first few days of training. So literally in only a few days of super training, you see students doing things that this guy can't do, but he's pretending to be an instructor. He's pretending to be an expert, but he doesn't have even the most basic skill. So first, assess the skill of the actual instructor who's going to be teaching you. Then, once you've assessed that this person knows what they're doing, next, look at the skill level of people they've trained. See, this stuff is very simple, obvious, and logical. Do not be a total idiot that goes and signs up for training and never even once verifies the skill of that instructor. Verify the skill, look them up on YouTube, try and find any videos of them demonstrating extreme skill level. Okay, then, of course, start looking at their students. Now, if they show you a whole bunch of promotional videos of a little kip of some guy standing lock-legged, this is not training. You have to look for videos of the students taking the steps. Step one, literally the very first most basic step that you should get within an hour is keep the glider above you. That's it. Just keep the glider up. Step number two, do the same thing with no hands. So look for their students to be reverse kiting and forward kiting with no hands on the controls. If you can't find even one single video, then obviously they're not training their students to do it. Next would be loading control. That's where you want to see people carrying the altitude of their body and controlling the altitude of their body using the glider. So look for videos of those students managing the altitude of their body using the glider, such as walking up a vertical wall or kiting on a post or pole or just sitting with their feet way out in front of them while they manage the altitude of their butt using the glider. If you don't have that skill, you cannot prevent a collapse. 
You cannot prevent a paraglider from collapsing, in which case you are thousands of times more likely to take a collapse. So take a school like Aviator PPG and look up videos. One of the first videos I came across is you hear a guy admit the amount of hours these students had practicing before they were trying to force into flying them. You can hear right in the video, the guy says, oh, they've been kiting for two hours. Next, we're gonna go flying. So determine how many hours of actual real hands-on glider control you're gonna get. Because you're not gonna learn jack crap in two hours. Literally, what real skill out there are you gonna learn in a couple hours? No. The master glider control takes 25 to 60 hours. 25 to 60 hours. So when you're looking at schools, look at how many hours. Ask the students, how many hours did you get actual kiting, no bull crap, hands-on, real, actual practice? If they're saying anywhere from zero to five hours, you're dealing with people that are totally incompetent. They're not instructors, they are absolutely asinine, heinously evil, chucking people in the air when they don't have even the most basic ability to control the glider. That is messed up. So look at the number of hours. Another good question to ask would be, how many of your students don't pass the class? And <laughs> That's a trick question that many of them will fall for. Oh, I guarantee you, you'll be in the air. No question, oh yeah, I don't care if you're 80 years old. I guarantee you're gonna be in the air in two hours. Well, anyone guaranteeing you're gonna be in the air doesn't give a crap whether you're coordinated, uncoordinated, half dead, running on a pacemaker, and have no ability to control the glider. They're chucking people in the air before you develop that skill. So that school had better be having people not pass. And maybe even look for complaints. People say, yeah, I went there and I trained the whole time and I never got to fly. They wouldn't let me fly. Now that's a good complaint. If they're saying, yeah, they chucked me in the air immediately and I crashed and died, that's probably not so good. The uh, more important, you know, I'd rather have a complaint of someone I didn't put in the air because they were not ready and their skill was not ready to be in the air than someone who says I chucked him in the air too fast when they obviously weren't ready yet. So very, very important that the instructor's doing their job. Look people up, look at the names. If you're looking at Blackhawk, who is the actual instructor? Is it Michael Mixer who broke his own back twice in the same year, who then killed two students in a single month because of sheer incompetence? Is this the instructor? Or is it Mike? You gotta look at the names. This is not a field to just blow smoke and pretend nobody should ever say anything and the truth should be hidden and oh, you should never say anything if you got killed and lost the leg and had your hand chopped off. No, this is exactly the field. You want people that are straight up honest and honorable enough to tell you the cold hard truth, even if it upsets people. Because what's more important, some fake instructor getting his butt hurt because of the truth, or somebody dying because they didn't hear the truth. So I'll take insulting the instructor any day over somebody getting scammed by that person and ending up dead. So very, very important. Look at the skill level of who you're talking to. Look up their students. Look at that name. And ultimately, you really should look for the best training. The very best. Because one oops. You just so much as bump a unit like a Scout or an Air Conception or Nirvana, and the whole unit explodes. The cage flexes into the prop and whap, the whole thing catastrophically self-destructs. Easily 2,500 to 6,500 in damages over and over and over if you do not have proper training. 
<laughs> a couple hundreds there. So th the cost of getting training and the time of training, if it saves you from damaging your gear even one time, it can more than pay for itself. So absolutely critical, even if you have to fly from France all the way to the US or fly from New Zealand or from Africa or Malaysia, it is well worth that plane ticket because $1,000, that's two props. Two. You break two props, or actually once breaking your prop cage frame, destroying your glider, is going to cost you double what that trip from New Zealand was to the United States. So it is worth getting the absolute best instruction in the world because it's more cost effective. You're going to have a heck of a lot more fun. You're going to save your life and you're going to save yourself from trashing gear left and right. Saving money, cost effective. Plus, bogus training drags on and on and on. It is much more difficult than people expect. And if you don't get proper training, you are going to struggle for years and years. Well, look at Eric Farewell, for example, of Aviator PPG. He got, he got scammed by Blackhawk. You can't call that training. And now look at him. Years later, he still literally can't even do what brand new super students can do. Brand new. Within a day or two of starting super training, people are already developing skills he doesn't have in years of flying. That is a perfect example that when you learn wrong, you practice wrong, and you just keep doing it wrong over and over and over, year after year. You do not just figure it out if somebody gives you a few tips. So life and death critical, get the best training in the world, and I'm almost out of sun, and this video is getting long. So, happy flying! Just give me a call, I'll save your dang life. And if you're not 100% sure I'm telling the truth, challenge me. Say, prove it, show me, prove it. Let's compare the skill of my students to the skill of their students. Not my word against their word, the actual skill of my students to the actual skill of their students. Skill against skill against skill. Look at the facts, ignore the BS, ignore the trash talking and name calling, and look at the facts. Either what I'm saying is correct, and you can verify it by watching videos, or it's not correct and I'm a liar. So by all means, feel free to post the video that proves what I'm saying is not accurate down in the comments. Go ahead, post the video. I challenge you because your life depends on it. Look, do some research. Look at the skills, compare skills. Then give me a call. Let's go fly it. That's a crazy landing. I landed with the wind. Check that out. Wind's going that way. 
No problem. If you have the right technique, with the wind is no problemo. Because it's about how you land. Once you set up that foot slide and the foot drag, and you get the skill to be able to manage that perfect slide, well, you can slide to a stop from 50 miles an hour, 40, 30, 20, it doesn't matter. So if you happen to land with the wind, it's not that big of a deal once you have super skills. If you don't have those skills, that could be a catastrophic issue because you thump into the ground at high speeds. Very, very important to learn how to fly properly. Too fun!